Ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen and ladies, ladies and gents, I've had quite a few people contact me regarding a writ of error quorum novus. Writ of error. That is where you get the court to correct some stupidity that they done did. I haven't been a big fan of writ of error quorum novus because in 1929, Congress abolished the writ of error quorum novus. Hold on. Give me one second to show y'all. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'd been doing a bunch of other things because I got sidetracked and I apologize to y'all because I was doing this for someone who asked me the question. So what we did is we created a writ of error quorum novus. What I was looking for was to prove to you guys that Congress had, quote unquote, said they abolished the writ of error quorum novus, but the Supreme Court came back and said, y'all ain't did nothing. So they had so many people not using the writ of error quorum nobis, because you'll see it'll say it's a seldom used. But look, the federal district court had the power to issue writ of error quorum nobis. It had the power to vacate its judgment of conviction and sentence. So that's what the Supreme Court said in 1954. Okay. So, ta-da. This is what I get to send to that individual so that they get to have this. As a matter of fact, no, I don't need to send them, see, the Act of Congress abolishing writ of error, but it didn't abolish the writ of error. The writ of error comes under the All Writs Act, and Congress doesn't have jurisdiction to abolish it because it's a judicial branch issue. So the writ of error, Congress doesn't have the authority to abolish. See, Congress can't touch the Judiciary Act. That's what everybody needs to understand. Once Article 3 was created, just like Congress can't touch Article 1, it doesn't have the jurisdiction. So once it was created, they were stuck because nothing in the Constitution grants it authority over another branch of government. So once it created it, it couldn't uncreate it. Isn't that interesting? Go back, look at the Supremacy Clause. Look at the separation of powers and the delegation of authority. Congress does not have authority to interfere with the courts outside of what they gave themselves. They can't un ungive themselves that because it's just the law. So that's the catch-22 situation that they find themselves in because, well, they stupid, okay? Now, um, this ain't going to be as long. Hold on now. I got to send it to the individual. What? Told you it wasn't going to take long. All right, so we produced a writ of error. And when we produced that writ of error, let's go here. Now, many of you are wondering what a writ of error is. If you don't know what a writ of error is, then technically you won't ever have to use it. But if you have somebody who's in jail and they violated his rights to put them in jail or her rights to put them in jail, you can do, after conviction, a writ of error. Now, they claim a writ of error is done after the sentence is completed. That's a lie. <laughs> so please don't believe that. Writ of errors are used to correct the error, to redress. That's what a writ of error quorum nobis is, is a petition for redress, okay? You want to break it on down. Karam Nobis. Good man, who Karam is? Karam, get your over here. Don't you got Ramadan? I'm sorry, I apologize. That must sound like it's supposed to be racist. It ain't. Uh-uh. Mm -mm. You ain't eating until tonight. You know it's Ramadan. I'm sorry. I met a lot of people who um, participate in Ramadan. And ladies and gentlemen, this is the Ramadan season. And in Palestine, they are having the most difficult times practicing their religion because of the particular group that claims that it is in the right and wants to interfere with them practicing their religion. Anyway, here is a copy of the writ of error. You guys will get a copy of this link. I'll give you this one. And what I'm going to do, I'm, I'm going to put uh, this other one, Rahil. One second, Rahil. No, not right there. I got gloves on, y'all, so y'all have to excuse me. That's why I'm moving around so slow on this computer, because I got gloves on. That's right. Gloves is on. Man, you got to have them gloves on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this link right here. Pay attention. I'm going to take this link. Pay attention. And I'm going to put this link right here. And I'm going to right here. Right here. There's the link. So if you want to get to the writ of error quorum nobis, I can't nobis, browse the internet or open nobody specific asks you to browse the internet. In the text. <laughs> okay. If you're looking for information from a specific website or need help with real-time data or current oh, events, boy. I can use my browser tool to look up information for you. 
Just let me know what you need, and I'll do Just my best to up. assist you. Ladies and gentlemen, what is the difference between admitting guilt and pleading guilty in a criminal case? Admitting guilt means admitting guilt refers to acknowledging responsibility for the crime without necessarily going through a formal process of pleading guilty. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, every time you guys enter a plea, doesn't matter if it's not guilty, no contest, doesn't matter if it's guilty, you're still admitting the genius of the record. You're admitting guilt. You're testifying against yourself. That's why the judges could say that everybody who's in jail are in jail because they volunteered to be there. They have not gotten me to enter a plea of guilty, not guilty, or anything. Now, I did do the plea of innocence, but any type of plea, including a plea of innocence, is admitting to the record of the court, admitting to the indictment, admitting to all of their junk. Now, by the way, you see these two right here? Right here. This one right here and that right there. Watch this. Sacom911.com. Sacom911.com. Why is Sacom911.com showing up? Because it searched the internet, and that's the only one talking about admitting to the genius of the record. I got that from Bradley Christopher Stark, y'all. Bradley Christopher Stark is the one who brought that to my attention when he did his affidavit and arbitration. Bradley Christopher Stark. That's where I got the genius of the record from. And I've been jumping on top of that one ever since. The term genius of the record has historical roots within legal proceedings, particularly in small claims court. It don't believe small claims court. It only did small claims court because of these two right here. That's all. That's the only reason why I did small claims court. So don't do the small claims court. It refers to an individual acknowledging the charges and claims against them and thus recognizing the fundamental authority and integrity of the court's record. This expressly signifies a legal acknowledgement of the information contained in the court's record impacting the outcome of the case because the acceptance of facts presented on the record. The origins of this term is traced back to historical legal practices where individuals accepted the record's accuracy, playing a crucial role in the legal proceedings. How is the term genius of the record used in legal proceedings? Watch this. We're going to do just this last one right here. Y'all can get the links. The term genius of the record is used in legal proceedings to describe individuals acknowledging blah, blah, blah. The genius of the record individuals essentially accept the validity and accuracy of the information contained in the court's record related to the case. The term signifies a legal acknowledgement of the facts presented on the record, which can have an implication on the outcome of the case based on the acceptance of the information. Stop testifying against yourselves, people. There are legal consequences when you testify against yourself. And that's what they're getting you guys to do all the time. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this one was short because we definitely wanted to point this out. Plus, I got some things outside, some work outside I got to go do. And I got to go talk to the dogs. I haven't talked to the dogs all day. Dogs need to be talked to, especially these two, because they're needy dogs. Nah, they, they, they loves me. Anyway, I just got to go take care of them. I hope your day goes good. Hope your day goes well. And we will speak to you next time. Have a good day, everybody. The links will be in the description. No, they won't. The links are going to be in the title. Got to go.